thanks for coming and welcome to FAU. For those of you that are guests and to the students, appreciate your attendance. This is part of an ongoing series known as the American <coughs> Cause. And the American Cause is uh, funded by the James Madison Institute. That's the website. They're based in Tallahassee, Florida. Francisco Gonzalez is uh, the representative of the James Madison Institute. He's on the leadership team at the foundation. And I'm going to make a few preliminary remarks, turn it over to Francisco to introduce our guest speaker and to say a little bit about the James Madison Institute and Intercollegiate Studies Institute. And uh, then with, uh, Mr. Spencer will make his presentation. After his presentations, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So think about questions you might have that you would like to have answered by somebody who really knows how Washington works and how it should work. Uh, the American Cause is titled after a book written by Russell Kirk in the 1950s. Uh, the Department of Defense commissioned Professor Kirk to write this book because he <coughs> found out, uh, the Department of Defense discovered that a lot of the veterans, active and retired, that were uh, in the U.S. military didn't know much about the founding principles or why what they were doing was so important. And we've heard the phrase American exceptionalism. This is, that's what this program is attempting to clarify. What is American exceptionalism? And one thing that we know about American exceptionalism that we're committed to individual liberty and individual freedom. So when you hear the word or the phrase free enterprise, that's freedom, that's individual freedom. And if you're opposed to free enterprise, whether you realize it or not, to a certain extent you're opposed to individual freedom. And we know from discussions in classrooms with students and professors and such that uh, American exceptionalism sort of has a bad connotation to it and that free enterprise has even a worse connotation to it. And so that's what we're going to try to consider, think about, analyze, and get some clarity on. Okay? But always remember that, and we mentioned this in all of our uh, programs, that James Madison in Federalist No. 10 spoke a truism when he talked about what was the purpose of the United States Constitution, and it was to promote and protect unalienable rights, life, liberty, and property. Without those three prongs, you can't have freedom. And so, in 1776, when we separated from Great Britain, it was about infringements on freedom, especially on freedom in the sense of free enterprise, what the framers referred to as a commercial republic. And the U.S. Constitution was an attempt to protect those even more, because the Articles of Confederation didn't have enough clarity as to what individual freedom was vis-a-vis -vis the government. And if you look at Article I, Section 10, it was an attempt to stop the states from engaging in things that were anti-liberty. So always remember, if you like freedom, individual liberty, you better reassess your commitment to free enterprise and the importance of free enterprise when it comes to the U.S. economy. And we have some literature in the back. If you don't have a copy, you're welcome to take a copy of the American Cause and some other literature that is made available to you. There's also some sign-up sheets and materials if you want to pursue this further. Okay? So I'm going to turn it over to Francisco to make a few remarks and to introduce our guest speaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marshall. And, uh, yeah, thanks for being here. I know uh, some of you might be here for extra credit, but it's, uh, it does say something either way that you're here after hours trying to... Uh, learn a little bit more about um, what's going on in our country and, and about the founding and, uh, and all, you know, what the American experience is all about. Um, my name is Francisco Gonzalez. I'm with the James Madison Institute. And as Marshall said, we are a public policy organization uh, based here in Florida. Our headquarters is in Tallahassee, but we do work all around the state. And most of our work is in public policy. We put out ideas. The uh, reason we're in, the, in Tallahassee is we, we, we're up there to uh, have an impact on the legislative process and on the decisions that are being made in our state's capital. Um, so we put out all sorts of public policy uh, ideas based on you know, quality research. We'll put out white papers throughout the year on, on subjects from public employee pension reform to uh, transparency in government, 
how to make, uh, you know, uh, basically what government spending goes on, how to make it more accessible to we the people so we can get on the internet with the new technology and find out where every dollar is being spent, um, hold our elected officials accountable. We, uh, we're, you know, we cover issues like property insurance or um, health care. You know, uh, Medicaid is something that's done at the state level. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, stuff, on, a lot of work on, on those issues. So all sorts of issues, uh, mostly economic-based issues for the state of Florida, we're focused on. So some people ask, well, why is your name the James Madison Institute? I um, mean, you're in Florida. We don't, we don't, we're not really a national organization. Of course, being in Florida, we're a microcosm of the nation with all the different people from all the different places, uh, not just in our country, but from around the world that come and settle in Florida, uh, particularly even throughout our entire history. So why do we call ourselves the James Madison Institute? Well, the founder of our organization was a man named Dr. J. Stanley Marshall. He's still with us. He's on our board. 25 years ago, he started the James Madison Institute. Previous to that, he had been president of Florida State University. And he started to realize, well, when you have a, uh, an organization, uh, or you have, you know, the legislature basically uh, depends on a lot of research from publicly funded, government funded universities. And so a lot of times what gets produced is government solutions to every problem uh, in the legislative process. And, and Dr. Marshall thought we needed an independent organization that uh, was privately funded and so that every solution, uh, the first solution wasn't necessarily to find a solution in government, that things can be found in the free market. And so that's why uh, Dr. Marshall uh, put that t uh, organization together. W to this day, we don't accept any government funds. Uh, we, um, and you know, sometimes government is part of the solution. Um, but what we say is that we, we look back at our founders and people like James Madison who wanted to articulate uh, what, where in society can individuals and communities come up with the solutions first and then you work your way up uh, to the, you know, you go, to, you go down to City Hall first for a solution. And then if City Hall can't help you out, you might go and take that issue to Tallahassee. And if Tallahassee can't help you out, or if there's an issue that crosses state lines, you know, then, then that's when you take it to Washington, D.C. In, in a way, uh, things have been a little bit reversed. A lot of times now we look first to Washington, D.C., and it's become such a, um, uh, a center of power. And even sometimes we notice that cities and counties or people in their communities don't look first to their, to their local government, they look to, to the national or even to the state level. So we took the name James Madison um, really because uh, our founder, Dr. Marshall, was really influenced by our nation's, one of our nation's pre preeminent founders, James Madison, who is the father of the Constitution and had a huge role in drafting that, um, that, that document and articulating what it meant through the Federalist Papers. Uh, so I hope uh, we can be a resource for you. Um, you can visit our website, jamesmadison.org. One of the other things we've, we've done in the last few years is not just focus on public policy, but focus on the citizenry at large. So we've always, all of our um, research has always, we've had accessible papers and journal articles and things like that that talk about, um, you know, that are, that are basically written for the, the general population, not just for our, our lawmakers. But in the last sort of four or five years, we've gotten more into doing programs for students. Uh, particularly, we have a civics education program that is for, uh, intended for uh, high school students. Uh, we, we, we distribute literature throughout the public schools across Florida. Uh, we also um, you know, do programs and different events. We have reenactors. We actually have a James Madison reenactor and a Ben Franklin reenactor that go around and, and do all sorts of things. So it's a, it's a, it's a lot of fun. But, uh, but we also uh, uh, help support this program on, 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 at FAU. Um, and so it is one of the more unique programs that we do for college students. And so I know that um, April 9th, we're going to return back here, and I'll look forward to seeing you. Marshall, actually, I'll be able to be in town for that. Um, our, our state's chief financial officer, who is a member of the governor's cabinet, Jeff Atwater, will be the speaker on April 9th. So I really hope that uh, you'll be able to attend that. Uh, uh, he's, he, was, he used to be the former Senate president as well before he took on this position, and he's from just up the road here in West Palm Beach and spent a lot of time actually in Broward in the banking industry. So he's a, a really great speaker and he's got his hands right on the state's finances. So you can bring all your questions to him. Uh, I'm sure he, he'll be ready for him. Um, but hey, one of the other things I wanted to talk about is some of the resources that, are, resources that are back there. There's lots of great organizations around this country that are doing a lot to try to stimulate um, a return to learning about America's founding principles. Um, many people, no matter what your political views are, uh, feel like our country has gone down a, a path where we've kind of forgotten where we've come from. And so 
Uh, one of those organizations uh, doc, um, Dr. DeRosa mentioned uh, is uh, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, ISI. Now, I was privileged enough uh, to, one, be an FAU alumni. Um, I, I graduated here in 2001, and, and this campus has just exploded. I, I, this is the first time I've actually seen the football stadium up close today. Um, and that was just great with all those residence halls. Those just were not existent. This building was actually one of the newest buildings on campus when I left. And uh, I, I, I don't even, I'm not even remembering kind of coming through here like this, but I, I just had a little visual today going, oh yeah, I remember this being on sort of the outskirts of the campus. Uh, so um, anyway, but I was an FAU alum that I went to uh, Maryland for grad school. And while I was there, I discovered this great organization, ISI, uh, put together lots of great, um, they put together a lot of great programs for students. Uh, they have an honors program and they give books and literature for free and all sorts of stuff for students. I mean, just a great organization. And the first book I actually read from ISI was this book, uh, Russell Kirk, The American Cause. And I'll tell you what, I got through it in a few hours. It's not that long because I was just like, uh, wow, wow, nobody, I, I had not come across a book that kind of put all of kind of what it means, what America means in just, in just this short a period. And Ru Russell Kirk wrote this in the 1950s, he was actually commissioned by the State Department. He had actually had a longer book that, th that inspired this. It was called The Roots of American Order, which I've since read. It's probably five or 600 pages. Did not read that in a couple hours. Um, but, uh, but the State Department actually commissioned him to write this because they were discovering that Amer American soldiers that were serving in Korea at the time did not, could not articulate what the country they were fighting for's principles. Um, and so they put together this short primer talk about the political, economic, and moral values of America. And so a really great book, and it's funny because uh, I actually went to then go work for ISI for a few years. Uh, great organization, got to meet lots of students, go and meet lots of professors like Professor DeRosa um, around the country that were doing programs like this. And it's funny because um, I just called up last week, we needed some extra copies of this book for today. You're welcome to take any complimentary copies back there. And the, the young man who's working there now is a name, name, man named Joseph Corey, and he uh, was actually a student at Central Michigan University. And uh, I had actually given him a copy of this book. And I got a nice little note back, actually, from him today with, with this that Dr. Tarosa just, just gave me. And it said, it's, he says, it's, a, it's kind of ironic um, that I'm now giving you books. Uh, he said, this book actually changed my life as well. He wouldn't be where he was without reading it. So it was very touching to me to see that. But I hope you also get a chance to... Uh, to read uh, this book. It's, it's a complimentary copy back there. Also, you can be a free, me free member of ISI and they'll give you great little journals like this with all sorts of things. So anyway, without further ado, I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, we're going to put this up on the website. If you missed the last lecture with Dr. Waleed Ferris, that's also up on the website as well. All you got to do is when you go to that website under issues, go to civics education and um, you'll see Civ civics education initiative and you'll see the, that's where we <coughs> place the video. And we'll do that again, and hopefully we'll see you again April 9th. But without further ado, we do have a, um, a guest speaker here today who uh, has come all the way from Washington, D.C., and he knows a little bit about what's going on up there, although he could probably tell you there's probably a lot going on up there he doesn't know about. <laughs> but he, uh, he um, his name is Glenn Spencer, and uh, Glenn is the uh, uh, vice president of the Workforce Freedom Initiative at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, if you're not familiar, they represent uh, many uh, private businesses around the country uh, that, be, that choose to become members of the chamber. And he could tell you a little bit more about that. And um, uh, Mr. Spencer has uh, worked for the Secretary of Labor, Elaine Chow. Um, while she was uh, the Secretary of the Department of Labor, he served as her chief of staff for several years. And... Um, uh, before that, he, wrote, he worked for some grassroots advocacy groups, such as Citizens for a Sound Economy. He also worked on the uh, uh, Republican National Sen Senatorial Committee. Uh, so he's just got a really great background in Washington, D.C. He, he also has a master's uh, from George Washington University. So he uh, brings a lot of knowledge to the table, and I, I, uh, I look forward to hearing, um, hearing from him now, as, as I hope you do. And please, uh, while he's talking, think of some many questions you can ask him. We'll have a hopefully a, a lively Q&A session after this. So I'll, I'll welcome up Glenn Spencer. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Francisco, for, it's my second introduction of the day. By the end of this week, you're going to be sick of doing those. Um, this is kind of a unique 
crowd for me to be speaking to. Typically when I go around the country, and I do that a lot, I'm speaking to small business owners, other business owners at state and local chamber meetings. Uh, never have I spoken before a group of college students, so if you want to uh, chime in and let me know your opinions, please do that. Hopefully this is not uh, something that's completely geared for business owners. <coughs> it's something that you'll get a lot out of too. Uh, now while Francisco indicated I do work for the U.S. Chamber, uh, what I'm about to say tonight, these remarks are not necessarily reflective of U.S. Chamber policy. I'm not here on behalf of the Chamber. These are my personal views uh, here. Now the cat is out of the bag. As he indicated, I used to work for the Republican Senatorial Committee. So if there's a little bit of bias in my remarks, uh, forgive that and feel free to correct me during the uh, Q&A session if you've got opinions that differ from mine. Uh, so with that, we'll get into it. What we're going to talk about tonight are uh, issues related to the separation of powers, regulatory poly policy in Washington, D.C., and how that may Im impact the free enterprise system. Uh, so now, as we all know, uh, the United States has three branches of government. You've got your executive, legislative, and judicial. And we all know that each of those branches has some very specific powers. Uh, and that there are checks and balances between each of those branches. And the checks and balances have, over the years, uh, kept government from getting too powerful, kept it from doing too much, uh, and that in, in turn has led to a vibrant free market economy uh, that really is the strongest economy in the world today. Uh, but what happens when one of those branches starts to erode some of those checks and balances? And that is what we're really going to talk about tonight, and particularly in the context of labor law, because that's my background. I work on labor policy, so I'm going to sprinkle this with a couple examples. I'll try not to get too much into the weeds on it if I can, um, but it'll just be examples that you can, uh, you can see to see how the executive branch may be encroaching on congressional authority. Now, since the birth of the republic, uh, there's been worries about the executive branch becoming too powerful. And these worries are not without foundation, because the executive branch frankly, has certain advantages over the other branches of government. Uh, the executive branch is personi uh, personified by one individual. That's the president. He's the only person who's been elected by everybody in the country. Uh, the executive branch, is uh, the president, is one person. So in terms of decision making, he's got an inherent advantage in reaching rapid decisions as opposed to 535 individual members of Congress. Uh, and while people around the world mm -hmm. know who the president is, very few people could tell you the name of a sitting Supreme Court justice or you know, the head of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Nobody knows who those guys are. Everybody knows who President Obama is, so that's another advantage that the President has in that balance of power. Uh, but there's another way that the executive branch can encroach upon the authority of the other branches of government, and that is through control of the regulatory agencies, uh, which in many ways, in my view, act almost as a fourth branch of government. There's 15 designated cabinet agencies, there's a host of smaller agencies, which in some cases are actually more important than the cabinet agencies themselves, but these are the nuts and bolts of government. These are the folks who make decisions on all kinds of things throughout our economy. They, they decide what kind of gasoline can go in your car. They decide the configuration of a public bathroom. These folks have tremendous uh, authority and control over our economy. Uh, in fact, when you're thinking about the minutia that the federal government actually regulates, consider this statistic. The 2009 edition of the Code of Fe Federal Regulations, that is the book that, that includes all the regulations that our government has put out and enforces. Uh, in 2009, that book was 163,333 pages long and it filled up 226 individual volumes. That is a huge amount of regulation. No one person in their lifetime could read through all that, but those are the things that the government actually enforces through those regulatory agencies. Now, these agencies, they issue rules, they issue regulations. These things actually have the power of law. In some cases, they actually have the power of law that goes beyond what Congress has passed. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but in part, that's deliberate. Because look, when Congress passes a bill, they can't spell out every single ramification of that law. They can't envision every single scenario that might come up uh, under whatever bill they passed. So what they do is they will delegate authority to one of these regulatory agencies when they pass a law. <coughs> and what that does is it, allow, it allows Congress to tackle a whole host of different issues. And if Congress had to spend all of their time becoming intricate subject matter experts, writing legislation in excruciating detail, they would never get anything done. Now there's probably some folks uh, in this room and some folks I know in D.C. who thinks Congress do they don't really get anything done anyway. And in fact, they'd probably prefer it if Congress did even less than it's already doing. Uh, but my point to say uh, here is that uh, Congress, what they do is they will pass laws that spell out clearly, or should spell out clearly, what their intent was in passing a particular bill, and then they will delegate authority 
to the regulatory agencies to put the regulations in place that implement that will of Congress. So in other words, the legislative branch legislates and the executive branch executes. However, regulatory agencies sometimes have different interpretations of what Congress meant. They have their own view. And these delegations of authority that Congress puts in place can sometimes be very vague, which allows great discretion uh, in terms of what and how one of these agencies decides to actually regulate. And moreover, these agencies and the political appointees who run them, and in all fairness, I was one of those political appointees, uh, sometimes they have their own agenda. And they will use their rulemaking authority to further that agenda and essentially make new law that puts that agenda into practice. Now there's a lot of the uh, examples of this across government, but uh, as I mentioned, I'm just going to focus on a couple of examples in the world of labor law. So if I get too far down in the weeds, uh, just stop me. Uh, but I think these examples will highlight uh, several ways in which the government can actually overstep its bounds in which, a, uh, in which a particular branch of government can expand their authority beyond what Congress might have intended. Okay, 1935, Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act. Now, the, NL the NLRA covers certain aspects of the employee-employer employer relationship, particularly with regard to forming a union and engaging in collective bargaining. Now, Congress did provide some very, very specific details in that bill, but they also created what they call the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB, which is a small uh, agency composed of five members. These are the board members themselves, uh, and those members are nominated by the President, confirmed by the Senate, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, later on as well, uh, and the Congress vested in the board the authority to implement regulations to enforce that law and to interpret that law. Uh, now, specifically what Congress said was they granted the board the authority, I'm quoting here, from time to time to make, amend, and rescind in the manner prescribed by the Administrative Procedure Act such rules and regulations as may be necessary to carry out the provisions of this act. And in, in addition to that rulemaking authority, uh, Congress also gave the board the authority to rule on case decisions. So when there's a dispute between an employer uh, and employees or a union, that case gets brought before the board and they rule on it as though they were a court of law. Uh, and in so doing, they set precedents and those precedents actually then have the force of law. Now over the past three years, there's been tremendous controversy over how the board has used its authority to issue regulations and to make legal rulings. Uh, now, of course, tremendous here is a relative term. You know, most Americans have never heard of the NLRB. They don't know anything about what it does. Uh, and that's not surprising. It's a fairly small agency. Uh, but for those of us who work in the field of labor law, uh, this really has been a case study in how a, regula a regulatory agency can abruptly, abruptly shift gears and how they can change the rules of the road and how they can basically make uh, new law. Now, on one hand, to be fair, unions view the board's actions as putting teeth behind a law that Congress passed, and they view their actions as bringing that statute into the 21st century. Uh, others would argue that the board is arbitrarily throwing out longstanding precedent to favor a preferred constituency and really pushing the envelope of its authority <coughs> in ways that Congress didn't, uh, didn't intend. All right, so without getting into some very, very technical things, uh, I'm just going to put out a few examples. Uh, one is a case called specialty health care which I'm sure nobody here has heard of, that's not surprising, uh, but it's a good example, again, of how the board has really pushed its authority. Uh, especially healthcare, it's a nursing home in Alabama, uh, and a couple years ago, the Steelworkers Union decided that they wanted to unionize a small group of nurses at this particular nursing home. Uh, now, you may find it odd that the steelworkers would want to organize nurses, that seems uh, sort of an odd place for them to go, uh, but the fact is that as union ranks have shrunk over the year, the unions have been looking for pretty much any place where they can recruit new workers. So uh, bottom line is they came down to Alabama, they found this nursing home, they decided they want to unionize a small group of those nurses. Now what the employer said was, no, you can't do that. You ca if you're going to organize, you have to organize a larger group of people and win a majority of that larger group. Well, this case made its way to the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, and what the board decided was that, in fact, the union should be able to organize this small group of people. They threw out decades of precedent, basically rewrote the rules of the road, and said from now on, unions all over the country can organize just small slivers of workers. They can basically gerrymander the groups that they want to organize, which is a dramatic change from, from the way policy has been uh, implemented for the past probably 40 years. So again, a very big change here, but one that the board just did through case law, through an administrative act. 
uh, contrary to what Congress had talked about in the statute, which was that a, uh, an employer should not have to deal with fracture, a fractured workforce and multiple small bargaining units. So again, one regulatory change there done through administrative action. Uh, another issue to mention, everybody here has heard of the Boeing company, they build fighter planes, they're, you know, commercial airliners, everybody heard, has heard of them. Has anybody, everybody heard of the case against Boeing? They were going to build a factory in South Carolina. I see a couple of heads, heads nodding. Okay, so a couple years ago, the Boeing Corporation decided they were going to build a new plant to build their 787, 787 Dreamliner aircraft. And they thought about it for a while, and they decided to put that plant in South Carolina, which is a right-to-work state. There's not very many unions in South Carolina. Typically, uh, Boeing's work had been done on the, on the West Coast in Washington State, which is a much more heavily unionized state. Uh, so when they did that, uh, the union in Washington State raised a complaint, and they brought that complaint to the NLRB, which decided to take up that case, and the NLRB decided they were going to launch an investigation of Boeing, and what they were going to attempt to do was to force Boeing to actually shut down that factory in South Carolina, where they'd already spent about a billion dollars to put the plant together, and they were going to force them to move that work to Washington State, where in fact there was no factory. They were going to have to build another one there uh, to do that work. Now those of us who looked at that case saw a couple of problems. One, uh, the board had never before demanded that a company uh, make a decision like that with regard to new work. Okay, there is case law that says that a company can't just shut down if they get unionized and move that work somewhere else and do it over there. That's called a runaway shop case. That's against the law. In this case, the company was deciding where to site new work that didn't exist before. So the board stepped in in a way that they had not done before and said, no, decisions about new work are now going to come under our authority as well. And the remedy they requested was, as I mentioned, that Boeing shut that plant down and build a new one in Washington State. Never before had the board demanded that an employer do that, move work to a place uh, where there was no factory to put it. So this case really represented a dramatic expansion, in our view, uh, of the board's authority over the free market economy. Uh, again pushing the envelope of their authority, stretching the power of the agency, uh, in our view, in a way that Congress uh, did not intend. All right, a couple more examples. I don't want to give you too many of these, but uh, two more. Uh, last year, the NLRB decided to finalize a rulemaking regarding a posting notice. And what the board decided was that every employer throughout the country should have to put up at their workplace a poster indicating uh, workers' rights to join a union, uh, engage in, in collective bargaining, engage in protected, uh, what they call concerted protected activity. Uh, the employer community was really up in arms about this, and frankly, I was a little bit surprised by that because uh, if you've been around a workplace, and you, you see them around this campus, I'm sure, too, workplace posters. I mean, there's one for worker safety, for minimum wage, for uh, USERRA rights, for all kinds of different things. Uh, so this was just one more poster, but the employer community really viewed this as a threat to their First Amendment rights. Uh, they viewed it as a completely one-sided poster that only spelled out certain rights under the Act, not other rights. Uh, and another thing that a lot of employers pointed out was that nowhere in the statute, the National Labor Relations Act, nowhere in there did it say that the board could require these types of posters. And they, they pointed out that in other statutes, that was in there. So if Congress had intended for the board to put in place this requirement, they would have written it into the statute, and they didn't. Uh, so that was one particular issue here, but again, the second issue was that the poster itself doesn't spell out all of your rights under the law. It didn't spell out the fact that you have a right to decertify a union or to opt out of union activity uh, completely in a right-to-work state or that you could not, uh, a union could not compel you to pay dues that were used for political purposes. Those things were not included in the, no in the notice. Now, in our view, surely if the board really wanted to inform people about their rights, they would have uh, included all those rights on the poster, but they didn't. So in any event, this is another example of the board pushing its authority going beyond what, now again, this is my opinion, going beyond what was called for in the statute. Uh, now several lawsuits have been filed uh, against that rulemaking, so we'll see in this case whether the judicial branch will step in and enforce those separation of powers issues and those checks and balances. Uh, okay, one, la one last example with regard to labor policy. Uh, last year, the board ruled in a decision called Camelot Terrace uh, that it could impose litigation fees uh, on a defendant. Now these litigation fees are put in place, or the board wanted to put them in place, to compensate itself for the time it spent litigating, litigating a case where the defendant was found guilty. So the board just said, okay, you're going to owe us X amount of dollars for the time our attorneys spent prosecuting you. 
Now, in some contexts, with Article III courts, that's, that's allowed, but the board doesn't have that authority. Uh, in fact, not only does it not appear in the statute, but a district court had ruled several years ago that the board expressly could not impose these litigation fees. But they went ahead and they did it anyway in this decision. Now, that decision has not yet been challenged in court, uh, so again, we'll have to see if the judicial branch will get the opportunity to once again enforce those checks and balances between the three branches. But you know, this, this last example, in my view, is a very clear one of the board overstepping its authority and assuming power that the statute did not give it. So those are just a few examples in the labor law context, uh, but again, they're meant to highlight just how a regulatory agency can seek to expand the boundaries of its authority. Uh, and there are many, many more of these across government. You know, I only work in a small sliver of federal policy, but you know, whether it's the uh, Corps of Engineers assuming ever broader definition of wetlands, whether it's the EPA assuming new authority under the Clean Air Act, there, there are myriad examples of this type of thing uh, all across the government. Now there's two laws that were passed in 2010 which are really gonna exacerbate the issue of regulation and government agencies uh, pushing the boundaries of authority and encroaching uh, probably to some extent on, on congressional authority. Uh, and that is uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, what some have referred to as Obamacare, uh, and then the Dodd-Frank financial reform uh, legislation. Uh, under Obamacare, uh, there are the, the law calls for 159 new agencies, panels, commissions, and regulatory bodies, each of which will be putting out more and more regulations to cover every aspect of health care in this country. Uh, and the Dodd-Frank financial reform bill alone calls for 447 new rules, 63 reports, and 59 studies. Now in addition, adi uh, in addition to those laws, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has another 200 regulations in the works. So uh, we can see pretty easily that that volume that had 163,000 pages in it is going to be a lot longer uh, over the next few years. Uh, now, of course, Congress is not unaware of these issues, and they're not unaware of the potential for regulatory agencies to overstep their authority. And over the years, uh, they've enacted certain laws to try and keep those checks and balances in place, to keep the regulatory agencies from going too far. Uh, now, unfortunately, the number of, of those laws that they passed really bears little relation to their effectiveness. Uh, in fact, Congress's ability to rein in the regulatory agencies, as we'll see, is really not all that great. Uh, but they do at least put some hurdles in the path of a regulatory agency that might want to go too far. Uh, one of those laws is the Administrative Procedure Act. Again, probably most of you haven't heard of that, but it's a very, very important law uh, that governs how regulations are actually implemented. Uh, under that law, <coughs> for example, regulatory agencies have to follow some very, very specific steps when they issue uh, a new regulation. They have to give the public a chance to submit comments on that regulation. Uh, there's usually a 60 or 90 day comment period where anybody uh, out there in the public who knows where to find this on a website can actually submit their comments and they can either say this is the greatest rule ever, they can say we hate this rule, you need to fix it in this way, uh, but everybody in the public does have that opportunity. Uh, in addition, uh, agencies can be sued under the Administrative Procedure Act if they go too far. Uh, if they put out a rule that really uh, abuses their authority, uh, if they put out a regulation that's deemed to be what's called arbitrary and capricious, uh, those are all grounds for suing an agency to try and get a rule overturned. And that does happen from time to time. Uh, but I will tell you that litigating uh, on an APA violation, uh, it, it's a tough lift. It, it's pretty much of a long shot to try and overturn a rule that way. Well, that, it does happen from time to time. Uh, Congress has also attempted to protect small businesses from excessive regulation. Uh, so agencies will sometimes have to commission what they call a SABREFA panel, which stands for uh, the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act. This was the law that Congress passed back in the 1990s. Uh, and as I said, it's intended to make the agencies prove that their rules are not going to have too, much, uh, too great an impact on small business owners, uh, won't stifle small business activity. Uh, but those panels, the SABREFA panels as they call them, they can be very time consuming. Uh, but the fact is, again, they really don't stop a determined regulator uh, from doing what they want to do. Uh, another tool that Congress has, what's called the Congressional Review Act. Uh, this is a law, again, that Congress passed back in the 1990s. Uh, and under this law, Congress can, with a simple majority in both chambers, uh, void a regulation that it dislikes. Uh, it's a privileged motion, so the Senate can't filibuster it. It only needs 51 votes to pass. Uh, and these, these, uh, these resolutions, in fact, there's going to be one coming up 
probably in the next four weeks uh, on a labor regulation, of course. Um, but the catch to this rule, or to this law, I should say, uh, is that the president actually has to sign the bill. So you may be able to get 51 votes in the Senate, you may be able to get a simple majority in the House, but the president have to, has to sign it. And if the president is from an opposing party, chances are he's not going to do that. So this law really has very, very limited effectiveness. In fact, uh, it's only been used once since it was passed back in the 1990s. Uh, back in 2001, Congress used it to void another labor regulation uh, on what was called ergonomics. And the only reason it worked then is because the Department of Labor had put that rule out at the very, very end of the Clinton administration. Uh, and then so when the new president came into office, he actually had enough of a window with a Republican Congress that they were able to vote this out and he was able to sign it. But that's the only, the only time it's really going to be effective is if you have a situation like that where a new president is coming in and has Congress that's controlled by uh, his or her party. Uh, and even worse, under the Congressional Review Act, you only have 60 days. So Congress has a very, very narrow window to use that law to try and overturn a regulation. So again, really not all that effective uh, as a tool. Congress does have a couple other aces up its sleeve. Uh, one is appropriations riders. So Congress, as we know, has the power of the purse. Uh, they pass appropriations bills that fund the government. And when they do so, they can put riders on those bills. And the riders might say something like, no funds in this bill shall be used to implement regulation X or no funds in this bill shall be used to issue a regulation on whatever the particular topic might be. Uh, so the, these riders do happen. Again, they're, they're difficult to pass, but from time to time they do. Uh, for example, in tw uh, just last year, in the fiscal year 2012 uh, Labor uh, HHS Education Appropriations Bill, uh, Congress put a rider in place that prohibited the National Labor Relations Board from issuing a rule on off-site electronic voting. I'm not going to get into the specifics of that rule, it's just an example of the fact that Congress does use that tool uh, and it can have an impact. Uh, but again, those riders are very, very difficult to pass. Uh, and even if you do get them passed, they're only effective for the fiscal year uh, in question. So at the end of that fiscal year, there's a new appropriations bill. That rider might go right out the window and the regulation you were hoping to block as a member of Congress can go into effect anyway. Uh, finally, Congress has the tool of the confirmation process. Uh, the Senate needs to confirm cabinet members. A lot of other positions throughout the government are confirmed by the Senate. Uh, and the Senate does, from time to time, use that power to hold up nominees it doesn't like. Uh, senators may also try to extract promises from a nominee during a confirmation hearing that that nominee uh, <coughs> will not work on a particular policy that that senator doesn't like. Uh, of course, the shelf life of those promises is about as long as the confirmation hearing itself. Uh, so that's really not all that effective tool. The main way that the Senate uses this is to simply block nominees that they don't like. Uh, but there's an out for this too, because the president, as we know, can make recess appointments. So the Senate may hold somebody up, but as soon as they go into recess, the president will make a recess appointment and put that person on the job anyway. Now, this, was, uh, this is the way it's worked for a long, long time, but back during the, the Bush administration, uh, the Senate, which was uh, in Democratic control after 2006, decided they weren't going to go into recess. They were going to hold pro forma sessions where somebody would come in uh, usually three days a week, bang the gavel to open the session of the Senate, talk for about 30 seconds, bang the gavel and go out. Uh, and they would do this again three times a week just to keep the Senate in session so that the President could never make a recess appointment. And in fact, for two years, that's, that's what happened. The Senate officially never took a recess and the President didn't get to make recess appointments. Uh, now, some of you may have heard about recess appointments made this year. Uh, in ja on January 4th, uh, President Obama decided he was going to appoint uh, four individuals uh, to the government. One was the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and three uh, were members of the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, and what the President, what the administration decided was that even though the Senate was holding these pro forma sessions, they really were not in session, that these were a sham designed to uh, deny the President his constitutional authority to make recess appointments. Uh, so this is certainly a contentious issue now. There's already been some litigation filed uh, claiming that the President did not have the authority to make these recess appointments. We'll have to see how that will all play out. Uh, but again, this is an opportunity for the judicial branch to step in and make a call on whether the appropriate uh, checks and balances were put in place here. Uh, clearly, you know, these separation of powers issues get decided by somebody other than me, by, decided by somebody other than Congress. In fact, Congress doesn't even have standing to sue 
Uh, that's why outside entities have had to step in and do that. Uh, one final way I'll mention that the administration uh, can get around congressional oversight of the regulatory agencies in the executive branch, and that is by appointing what they call White House czars. Uh, and they'll do this for environmental policy, they've, do, they've done it for uh, transportation policy, drug policy, all kinds of different things. I don't even know how many czars there are now, uh, but those czars, unlike cabinet officials, don't have to testify before Congress. You know, a cabinet officer, uh, at least twice a year, sometimes more than that, will have to go before Congress and they will have to testify and they will have to take questions from the members of Congress as to what they're doing with regard mm -hmm. to a whole host of policies. Well, these czars don't have to do that. And in addition, these R's are not subject to the confirmation process uh, because they are not cabinet officers. Uh, that said, though, they do exercise, uh, they can exercise a tremendous amount uh, of authority over policymaking. Uh, so as we think about the system of government that the founders set up, uh, a system that was intended to limit the power of government by maintaining these checks and balances between the agents or between the three branches, uh, I just want to make sure that we're all cognizant of the ways in which particular branches can seek to erode those constraints. Now, in past years, uh, particularly in the post-Civil War era, uh, the concern was that it was Congress seeking to dominate the executive branch. Uh, but in fact, oh, I'm sorry, and there's always been resistance to judges who uh, sometimes are, are said to be legislating from the bench. Uh, but in recent history, the biggest focus has been on the executive branch and how the executive branch is eroding the authority and the checks and balances between itself and Congress. Uh, and you know, in my view, that's been exacerbated by the actions of the current executive, but uh, I'd love to hear other people's views on that uh, the topic when we do Q&A, which we'll do in just a second. So I just wanted to give you all a sense of uh, how the regulatory agencies work, uh, a couple of examples of how they can expand their authority, how they can erode those checks and balances. Uh, and if any of you decide to make a career in Washington, D.C., uh, keep in mind that those, those regulatory agencies are a critical part of how government works, and it's a part that people often overlook. But those agencies do have a lot of power in Washington, D.C. They have a lot of ability to affect policy, and they have a lot of influence over our lives and our free, mar uh, free market economy. Uh, so with that, I will be more than happy to take <coughs> any questions, opinions, uh, colorful or otherwise, that people might have. I'll start off, uh, Ben. Could, could you uh, address the <coughs> drag the, these regulations have on um, economic growth and opportunity? Yeah. Because there seems to be a sense that among students that you know there's not much opportunity out there. They're turning to the government rather than individual private initiative. Yeah. And yeah. My response to a certain extent, well. You're turning to the government, but that's why there's not much opportunity because of the startup costs and things like that, uh, compliance with regulatory policy. Can you just you know, give us a sense of uh, your opinion on that? On that yeah, issue? I mean, the, the overall figure, you know, I don't, I don't have, I can't remember the exact dollar figure off the top of my head, but it, a couple years ago, it was somewhere around the order of $700 billion a year uh, in compliance costs to meet, the, to meet all the burdens or the, the uh, policies laid out by our regulatory system, and I think it's only gone up since there. I think I saw one estimate recently, it's over a trillion dollars now. These are compliance costs. These are costs that businesses have to pay out, uh, out of pocket, uh, to, to meet all the uh, criteria laid out in, in federal regulatory policy. And I'll give you one, one quick example. Uh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, a law that I think most people would say is a good thing, and we, we should have passed that. But under that law, uh, I, I reference the example of a public bathroom, well that law uh, put in place a regulatory system whereby the federal government determines the exact configuration of that bathroom. You know, exactly how many inches from the floor a light switch can be, how many inches from the floor a sink can be, you know, the exact way that the door needs to be set up, those sorts of things. And if, if a business is not compliant with that, they get hit with fines. In fact, there's a, uh, there's a cottage industry of, of trial attorneys that go around the country, go into small businesses, and we'll point out to them, hey, you know, uh, I just noticed in your bathroom your mirror is, is an inch too low or too high. Uh, and in fact, we'll, we'll file a suit under that. Or you can just settle now and pay X amount of dollars. And, you know, these small business owners, what are they going to do? They settle. Uh, so that, that's just one small example. But uh, there are examples like that all over the government. I mean, it, it is a very, very big regulatory cost. And another thing I'll mention on that front is that businesses don't always know what direction regulatory policy is taking. So they're trying to plan out five or ten years in the future. They're seeing these dramatic changes uh, under the current administration, 
that, that leave them wondering, well, where, where should I invest? You know, what sorts of, of uh, investments am I going to make to create jobs in the future when I have no idea what the regulatory burden is going to look like? So I, I hope that gives you, a, gives you an answer to what you were. And, then, and even the legal profession, the Administrative uh, Procedure Act allows the legal profession, they were one of the main lobbyists in getting some of these regulations passed because the law allows them to engage in that type of what in the real world we would call shakedown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you used that word, not me, but uh, <laughs> question here. Um, it's, it's really a two-part question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, back, back in the, uh, the 19th century before there were unions and things like that for, to, that were protection for the workers and stuff, you know, a worker would get hurt at work, mm -hmm. lose a hand, and he'd never be able to work again. And, you know, his family would suffer and, and uh, things like that. Um, I worked in a union mm -hmm. um, before I started school. Uh, one time uh, I got hurt at work. I, <laughs> I actually got a hole drilled in my thumb. And mm -hmm. one of the benefits that I got was is they let me go to the doctor immediately and have my, my thumb looked at and taken care of and uh, at no cost to me because it, it wasn't my fault. It was an mm -hmm. accident. Um, I think uh, my, my uh, major is also environmental science, so like I, I hope to work in the private industry one day. I want to do research. I want to do research and things like that. But um, I think you made a good case for um, overstepping of uh, you know boundaries and things like that. But I think a case can also be made for the necessity of regulations in some cases. Um, so. I, I admit that you know reform is necessary because you know I do have some conservative views. I believe that you know like I don't want the government in my business a lot. But um, my first question is: Is would you admit that regulation is necessary in some cases? Well, certainly as a fan of the free market, uh, yeah. I mean, there are certain criteria that do need to be laid out. I mean, you don't want people running around cheating on weights and measures. You don't want people cheating on. on the tax code, you do have people who are obeying the law and, and people who are violating the law, and you want to make sure that that's consistent. So yeah, I would say there is a place for regulations. You need something that spells out the rules of the road. That's, that's one reason it's necessary. The second reason, it, reason it's necessary is because, as I talked about it in, in the presentation here, you know, Congress cannot spell out in a law every single ramification of what it's doing. They, they simply don't have time or expertise to do that. They need to delegate things to these agencies. Uh, so yeah, I, I think you're right. There is a place for it. Uh, the, the danger is when it gets too excessive. That's why you've got those checks and balances in place that are supposed to keep it, keep that from happening. Okay. And my second question would be: Is how would you go about reforming these regulations? Uh, one of the main things that we need to do is get a, a rational system of cost-benefit analysis, pl analysis in place. Uh, so under current law, there are cases where an agency is going to have to justify it. They will have to do some sort of cost-benefit analysis to say, okay, we're, we're putting this rule out, we think it's going to cost X, and we think it's going to, in the case of an environmental regulation, they might say it's going to save X amount of lives, which makes it worth X amount. So the, the benefits clearly outweigh the cost. Uh, but the numbers that are used in those calculations aren't always, uh, I don't want to say completely accurate, but there are differing views <laughs> as to their accuracy, so I think there needs to be a uniform system of, of how you're actually doing your cost-benefit analysis. Uh, I think there probably ought to be more chance for input by Congress in some major regulations. So for example, if a regulation's cost is expected to be over, you know, I'm just going to pick a figure out of thin air here, let's say $100 million, uh, Congress really ought to have a chance to vote on that because frankly that, that regulation is going to have the force of law as though Congress had passed it. It's going to be enforced by regulatory agencies, agencies which in some cases uh, can punish with criminal sanctions, so you, you may be put in prison for a regulation that you violate. So I think there, there needs to be some more input by Congress. Congress ought to be able to take a look at a major regulation that's coming down the pike and give it an up or down vote. So th those, are, those are two steps right there I think we ought to take. Are you familiar with the uh, plan protects and prote plan prevent protects <coughs> regulations of the sure. Department of Justice? Does that hurt employers overwhelmingly? And I would also wonder what the influence of illegal immigrant hiring has on free market? Uh, the influence of illegal immigrant hiring? Yeah. Okay. I mean, they, when, you know, companies, whether it be farmers or actual corporations, hire illegal mm -hmm. immigrants instead of putting them on the books and processing the Right, and right. Uh, well, let me deal with the plan, prevent, and protect issue first because that's a Department of Labor uh, regulation, so I'm a little bit more familiar with that. I, I don't work on immigration policy, so I may not address that quite so much. Uh, 
Does anybody here know what Plan, Prevent, and Protect is? That ring, you're probably the only one here that, that knows that. Uh, basically, it's a new, um, it's not necessarily a new regulation, it's more of a new enforcement strategy uh, that the Department of Labor is putting in place. Uh, and what it's intended to do is to have employers uh, basically put in place preventive strategies uh, to keep workers from being injured or that sort of thing on the job. My, my problem with the, the policy that the department's laid out is that if you actually read their strategic plan from I think it was two years ago, the way that they've laid this out is uh, every employer that's subject to the laws uh, of the Department of Labor would have to list all those regulations that impact them They'd have to list out a compliance plan for how they're ensuring that they are meeting every one of those, those criteria. Uh, they would have to put in place a plan that shows the department how they're making sure that that plan is working. And then at the end of it, they're supposed to be able to demonstrate that they've actually achieved results. So for example, uh, I put this plan in place two years from now, I might be able to show, okay, I've got a uh, two or three percent decline in lost, uh, lost work days due to injury or something of that nature. Um, which in and of itself sounds fine, but at the end of describing this, what the department says is that any employer that does not, in fact, put that plan into place and show the department that it's actually working is going to be considered to be in violation of the law. So essentially, they've flipped the law on its head to say that you are basically guilty until you prove to us that you're innocent, which in my view is, is really a wrong-headed way to go about enforcing labor law. What we did when I was at the department is we had a, a big program of compliance assistance. So what we would say is, uh, we put out these laws, we put out these regulations. Our job is to make sure you know how you're supposed to follow that. And this current department has really gotten away from that. They're, they're focused much more, I think, on a punitive uh, way of trying to enforce the law. So I think that the, the strategy under Plan, Prevent, Protect is probably not going to be that successful. One other problem with it is that those plans that, a, that an employer might put together uh, are going to essentially become public documents. So if I'm an employer and I lay out this plan to say, here's how I'm going to meet all these, new, these OSHA standards, uh, and I show at the end of that plan that I've now got a uh, 3 to 4 percent decrease in lost work days, basically what I've just said is, okay, I wasn't obeying the law before and there were injuries. So think about how many trial lawyers will be going through those reports and trying to figure out who was or was not being compliant with every single So any, any injury you may have had uh, for whatever reason is going to be subject to some kind of litigation. That's my other problem with it. Now, the plan as you, as you described it uh, was a regulation. It's actually not a regulation. It's more of an enforcement philosophy. Uh, there are actually no regulations currently uh, in place under Plan, Prevent, and Protect. Uh, the Department of Labor was thinking about a wage hour regulation which would have what they were calling the, the wage hour right to know regulation which basically would have said, okay, you, you come and work for my company, at the start of it, I need to tell you, here's how much you're going to make, which pretty much every employer would do anyway. <coughs> but in particular, I would have to tell you uh, whether or not you are eligible for overtime, whether you consider white collar or otherwise, all those sorts of things. Seems like common sense. You probably would think you would tell that to employees anyway, but the department was worried that people weren't doing that. And they were going to put this new regulation in place, all kinds of paperwork requirements to demonstrate that you were doing that. Uh, th they've kind of pulled the plug on that now. I think they, they've sideline that for some other uh, policies that they're going to be working on. OSHA has a what they call I2P2, Injury Illness and Prevention Program regulations they're trying to work on. Uh, that is taking an awful long time to get done. Do you think it was a handout for trial lawyers? I don't think it was a handout for or trial lawyers, no. Way, uh, a nice clear path to find more clients? I, I wouldn't want to say that that's why the department did it, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that certainly was an unintended impact of it. Uh, that by making these plans essentially public documents, you are, you are painting a roadmap for litigation. Thank you. Um, it seems as if a lot of these regulatory agencies come about as a response. Mm -hmm. Say maybe an oil spill on the Gulf Coast, or maybe a financial recession, such right. as the one that happened in our country. Do you, do you really think that the invisible hand at the end would have prevented this sort of thing of happening again? Or do, you, or do you have more of a personal solution that maybe not a reg, uh, regulatory agency should have been created, but there should have been another solution to, let's say, either another oil spill or another financial disaster? Yeah, I think the, the problem you have with regard to the financial regs, and again, I, I'm not a complete expert on financial services or any of that sort of stuff, so, uh, you know, take what I'm going to say with a grain of salt. But, uh, you know, you had an extensive set of regulations on the books already 
dealing with financial issues, dealing with conflict of interest issues, dealing with all those sorts of things that led to the, the recession, uh, they just weren't being properly enforced, frankly. And so now you've got on top of that this mammoth new regulatory pro uh, system called the Dodd-Frank bill, which is going to require, as I, I indicated, a whole host of new financial regulations, which companies are already finding very difficult to, to comply with, and they haven't even really gotten started on the rulemaking process. In fact, the government can't keep up with it because there's so many rules being called for. Uh, you know, one of the things that was passed back in two, I think it was 2002, in response to what was considered to be another big financial meltdown, the Enron bankruptcy, uh, Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley bill. So there was already this fairly substantial uh, financial reform bill in place when the recession happened in 2008. So suddenly Congress puts in place another layer of regulations on top of that. So yeah, will these new ones be any more effective? Depends who's enforcing them. But what they are doing is, is causing companies to spend a lot of money on compliance costs uh, and really creating a, a climate of uncertainty for businesses that are trying to expand. In the back. Yes, hi. You briefly mentioned uh, about Obamacare, mm -hmm. and you also mentioned that you're a Republican. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to know, um, especially now that we're in recession, you did used to uh, work with the, uh, the legal department. What is your opinion? Because uh, whether it's with Obama or not, or not and I work in the medical field, and I know there's going to be a big change mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the medical field. And I'm also in school. And the concern of a lot of, I think a lot of students also in college is, what's we've done educating ourselves, how is the workforce going to be out there? And you did briefly mention that there is going to be a lot of different uh, regulatory rules and uh, hundreds of regulatory um, groups and, and communities that are trying to organize. But um, what's your opinion overall um, with healthcare in regards to the workforce? Um, because with this change, there is going to be a, a need for more people that, that work in the medical field. And um, what's your opinion, you know, the pros and, and the cons of, of this change? Well, there's going to be a need for more people in the medical field regardless <coughs> of whether that law was passed or not. Um, that's, that's one of the fastest growing sectors. And we, and we saw that during the whole time I was at the Department of Labor, uh, that the need for skilled uh, nurses, uh, for uh, home health care aides, for those sorts of things, those were positions that, that there were going to, the demand for those was going to be greatly increased over the, the, the coming years. We hear a lot about OSHA and the whole of it. I mean, you just mentioned the briefing now, and that's a name I hear constantly. Yeah. Just learning about everything. Um, yeah, I mean, look, under, under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, again, I'm not a health care expert, I don't want to pretend to be, but I, I know enough about uh, the regulatory impact of that. It's, it's going to be substantial. And I don't think we even know yet what the full ramifications of that will be. Uh, we, we've just gotten started with it, and already they, they've come out and said, well, it's, the cost is probably going to be double what we had expected it was going to be. Uh, and if the history of, of some other federal entitlement programs are any indicator, uh, it's going to be a lot more expensive than that. So it may just be a question of we don't have the money to, to do it. Um, <coughs> Now, there's also a Supreme Court hearing uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. There's going to be oral argument for the Supreme Court on the constitutionality uh, of that law and whether it will survive. I can't give you a prediction as to how the Supreme Court's going to rule on that. I don't know. They, they could strike down the mandate and leave the rest of it in place. They could strike down the whole thing. They could say the whole thing's constitutional. So I, I don't know. Uh, I will tell you this, though. If they strike out the mandate and leave the rest of it in place, then you've got a much bigger problem. Uh, because there is no way a private insurer is going to be able to take on all the new uh, uh, roles that they'll have to play under the law. For example, you know, no pre-existing conditions, uh, automatic coverage as soon as you come to sign up, those sorts of things. They simply can't do that and remain viable. Uh, so that would probably be the worst of all worlds for, for the Supreme Court to say that the mandate's unconstitutional, but the rest of it stands. But I, I really can't predict how, how they would come out. And all we know is that it's it's an expensive bill. It's probably going to get a lot more expensive uh, as time goes on, if it, if it stands. Um, you mentioned a couple times like the separation, like the checks and balances, the eroding of that, specifically with the executive branch. Mm -hmm. what, what are some examples that you see that happening, and like what specifically what do you see with that kind of separation? Uh, well, there's a couple of examples, you know, in, in the labor sphere where, that I mentioned, um, but there's a lot of others across across government. And, and you know, the simple fact of the matter is, Congress doesn't have the time or or expertise 
to do everything that one would hope they would do. What, what Congress really needs to do is pass laws that are more clear as to what they intend. So in other words, if I, if I intend for the outcome to be A, I need to make that very, very clear in the legislative language that that's what I want. Uh, another thing that really gets overlooked, you know, you see if you watch C-SPAN, uh, you'll see House members and Senate members get on the floor and they'll talk for 15 or 20 minutes about a particular bill and they'll state what they hope it does, think it should do, that sort of thing. Well, courts actually do go back and look at that. Uh, when they look at, you know, somebody sues to overturn a regulation that you know, somebody thinks it went too far, so they sue on it, and the courts go back and look. They will actually go back and look at those remarks and say, okay, well, Senator so-and-so who introduced the bill, here's what he said on the floor about this. Uh, so that, you know, that's, that's important for policymaking, but really what, what Congress ought to do is, is make sure that the laws they pass are, are very, very clear in terms of what they intend. Uh, again, they can't, they can't pass a law that, that covers every potential ramification, but they, they, they ought to shoot for a little more clarity. You just mentioned, with respect to the uh, Affordable Health Care Act, mm -hmm. that we don't know the uh, the consequences and costs that it will come. In hindsight, knowing the costs that the mortgage crisis caused mm -hmm. to this economy, what regulations would be appropriate to have put in place? Well, I, I, well maybe not specifically, mm -hmm. but would regulations have been a good idea in hindsight? Or should we have stand clear and let the free market? No, I mean, as I said, there were already a lot of regulations in place. Uh, that weren't necessarily being enforced, and there were people who were supposed to be looking at some of the transactions that these companies engaged in uh, and just didn't see any of it. Uh, you, know, you may remember the, the story about Bernie Madoff, who engaged in you know, a, a wholesale uh, amount of fraud and uh, abuse. But people were reporting to the SEC for a couple of years, hey, you, you need to look at this guy and look at what he's doing, and nothing happened. They, they didn't get into any of it until until it was way too late. So uh, before we, we rush in to say, okay, we need a whole host of new regulations on, on uh, financial services companies, probably I'll look at what's already on the books and see was that being enforced? Were, were those regulations that would have been, uh, would have been effective uh, before we rush in and put new ones in place? That, that's just my view. Okay. You may have a different opinion. I guess you probably do. But, I do, uh, but yeah, thank you for your, your answer. Um, you mentioned that you feel as though this president is responsible for a lot of the, the current executive branch overstepping its, its boundaries. Um, I know, uh, not in regards to another issue besides uh, labor, I'll, I'll get back to the labor, but I know the Patriot Act was mm -hmm. signed into law by George Bush. Um, uh, it was basically furthered uh, by the NDAA that Obama signed in, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so from my, I, and I know right now there are you know, I'm from Indiana, I love Indiana, but uh, in Indiana, like, it's a Republican state. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of, uh, they've been trying to, like, uh, strip the union's rights to collective bargaining. Um, I don't know exactly how much, or like, the, the extent of it, but I know that that's been a huge issue. And so my question to you is, uh, in regards to labor, because I'm, sh I'm, I assume that's what you're talking about when you mm -hmm. talk about the president overstepping the boundaries. What has he started that, in your view, oversteps the boundaries? All right. Well, let me let me mention your your Indiana question first. Well, I guess it wasn't a question, but you mentioned you're from Indiana. What the state of Indiana did is they passed a right to work law uh, at the start of this year through their legislative session. Uh, they, it's a Republican dominated state, so it went through fair, quite yeah, fairly quickly. Uh, and what that bill did is it basically says that no one can be compelled to be uh, a member of a union. And in some states, they're, they're what they call closed shop states, where the union wins an election at your workplace. Whether you want to be part of it or not, you have to be. Uh, you have to pay dues to keep your job there, or agency fees, as they, as they sometimes call them. But in Indiana, that's not the case. They became the 23rd right to work state. Uh, no one has to be a member of the union. They don't have to pay any dues, and they, they can still work there. So that, that's, I think, what you're referring to with how they've, they've uh, I mean, I've, I've had other things about it, but uh, I guess I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's a lot of different opinions on that issue. Uh, you know, if there were somebody here from, from the labor unions, they would probably tell you something very, very different than what I just told you about that bill. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I forgot your, the second part of that question. Uh, what do you feel is, what do you feel Obama is responsible for, for overstepping his boundaries in regards to, uh, like, new, new things, like you were saying, yeah. the current administration? 
Well, again, at least uh, in the context of labor stuff, just because that's, that's what I know best. I mean, there's the examples we talked about here. Um, yeah, but those aren't the only ones, even in the labor universe. Uh, there's another regulation the Department of Labor is putting out on uh, persuader rules, which is going to attempt to overturn the way that that statute uh, has been interpreted since it was passed in 1959. There's a law called the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act, uh, which requires financial reports by unions. It requires financial reports by employers if they're engaged in activity that's deemed to be persuader activity, which means that they're engaged in activity to uh, convince a worker whether or not to vote for a union and, and some other things too. Uh, but the way that law has been interpreted really since it was passed in, in the late 50s was that the only way <coughs> that you trigger those, those persuader reporting requirements is if you are actively and directly uh, talking to workers. So let's say I hire an attorney. Let's say you're an attorney, I hire you. As long as you are just purely advising me on things I might say or might not say, you wouldn't have to report. Uh, this regulation would totally throw that out the window. It would require a host of, of entities to start reporting uh, a lot of financial information. Um, and again, it's, it's completely changing the way that that statute's been interpreted since it was passed in 1959. In my view, it's probably beyond uh, what Congress even intended. So aside from the examples I mentioned here, you know, there's, there's just one more there. there. There's a host of other cases we could get into. Now, in the beginning of your question, you asked about, or you mentioned the, the Patriot Act. And I don't want to suggest here that, that these concerns about the executive branch overstepping their bounds or eroding some of those checks and balances is unique to Democratic presidents. It's not. I mean, that's a concern that's been expressed about presidents from both parties. Uh, and, and you mentioned that bill in particular, the Patriot Act. When that thing was passed, there, there was a lot of concern that that was overstepping the, the bounds of the executive authority across a whole host of areas. Now, I think the, the current administration has, as you mentioned, largely you know, ratified that law by not doing anything to get rid of it. Um, but it, it's, my point is it's not unique for a Democratic president to be accused of overstepping their bounds. The Republicans certainly get that, that complaint, too. I, I hear a lot these days that you know, it's all the Democrats' fault. So. No, no, I mean, this is, this is a phenomenon that's, that's unique to, to parties across either uh, you know, both sides of the aisle. In fact, this example I mentioned in the post-Civil War era where the concern was not that the executive was, was overstepping their authority, but that it was Congress that was trying to trample on the executive uh, branch. That's when uh, Congress was controlled, dominated by, by Republicans. So really, it's an issue that, that cuts across both parties. Isn't it kind of like also, you know, Congress's lack, lacks of action in trying to uh, oversee these regulations or fact that there aren't any, but the executive branch is using that to interpret regulations the way they wanted to because of the vagueness of congressional acts and legislation. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly right. And especially like um, also pulling these people who work in these executive branches accountable for possible violations, how there's you know, not really much oversight or accountability in any administration for that in, in regards to like, you know, Congress's duty to do that to oversee. Yeah, and I think that's exactly right, and, and it's, it's twofold. It's one is Congress is passing laws that maybe are a little bit vague and don't clearly spell out what they intend to get done or how it should be done, but then the fact that Congress really doesn't have uh, that much in the way of effective tools to hold these regulatory agencies accountable. And, you know, the person you blame for that or the entity you blame for that really is Congress, right? Because if they wanted to pass a law that would give them greater authority, they could do it, uh, but they haven't. So at some point, maybe they will do that. Um, but until then, yeah, we've got the situation we have now. We would definitely agree there that within the checks and balances, there definitely would need to be a lot more balancing and checking on what these regulatory uh, agencies and committees are doing. It seems like this is only the things that we know about, but I'm sure there's a lot of, there's always things, a lot of things that are going on that are, you know, there's a lot of law that are not always being uh, put into place. And then you said, you know, there's different enforcement of of it at the times, and it's like, okay, they've been doing this, which is not right. Well, why isn't it being changed? Who's checking them then to make sure it gets rid of it, or, or to change that, which seems like it's going to be even longer process to then enforce that these committees, you know, don't you know, do what they're supposed to be doing or, or not to be overstepping their boundaries, or certain, the certain examples that you gave now, are they all being, uh, now being handled to, to being changed, and they're all being, um, checked by uh, the judiciary uh, branch that, you know, Well, in, in a couple of these, yeah. I'm sure there's a lot that aren't. Yeah, in a couple of these examples, the 
these things haven't taken a court, so the ju judicial branch will wind up stepping in and maybe uh, changing things, maybe not. It depends. You know, you can never predict what uh, what a court is going to do. Uh, but again, it goes back to Congress. You know, they if they want greater authority or great, greater oversight of these agencies, they need to step up and do it. Um, whether it's through oversight hearings, whether it's through uh, new legislation that would give them uh, greater say over regulatory policy. You know, Congress has, has the ability to do that if they want to. And since they're not, with, with some, you know, in some other examples, that means then these agencies are setting the boundaries and nothing, nobody's putting them into place. They're able to do that and Congress is allowed to do that. Well, they're, you know, one of the things... One of the things you'll find in, in D.C. Uh, is that there are trade associations and interest groups that cover every facet of every sliver of government you could possibly imagine. So in some senses, these are the groups that often bring a lot of these issues to the attention of Congress um, to say, hey, you know, did you see this, this regulation just came out? Um, so there, there is at least somebody is, is keeping an eye on this stuff. That doesn't mean they can do anything about it. but. Uh, and again, the, the Administrative Procedure Act did put in place the public comment process, right? So an agency puts a rule out, they'll put in place uh, anywhere from a 30 to 90 day comment period, which sounds great, but most people have no idea. Well, first of all, most people don't even know these regulations are, have popped out there. Uh, second of all, to the extent that they do, they may not really know how to submit comments on it. It's not a particularly easy process. Uh, and it's really a difficult process to submit comments uh, such that an agency will actually change what they want to do based on your comments. You know, it's one thing to write in a letter that says, hey, I hate this rule, fix it. Yeah, nothing's going to happen. But to really submit detailed comments that are going to make the agency go back and rethink how they do things, it's expensive to do that. I mean, you need technical expertise. Uh, you usually will need to have an attorney who can sit there and write these, these comments for you. So it's, it's a tool, but it's a limited one. Glenn, you, you kind of uh, hinted at something I was going to ask about when you talk about trade associations um, being there and sort of watching the government, if you will. Um, you talk about separation of powers, really, the three branches of government, executive, judicial, and legislative. What about sort of the other facet of our system, uh, individuals and, and, the, and the states in relation to the federal government? Um, what role do they play in this regulatory environment in sort of being in check? on the federal government, um, sort of infringing on the rights of individuals and the powers of states? Yeah, it depends, <coughs> excuse me, it depends on the law in question. Uh, so in some cases, states have very broad authority uh, to issue rules and regulations of their own. Uh, there are certain areas where states have, have regulatory prominence. Uh, but in others, the federal government, when it passes law, will put in place a strong preemption uh, doctrine. And this, this really applies in the context of, of labor law, where there is a very, very strong presumption of federal uh, control over that, that space. Uh, so a state may wish to pass uh, certain laws that will differentiate it from uh, other states, but they can't always do it. And a good example of that is um, a bill that uh, had some prominence a couple years ago called the Employee Free Choice Act. I imagine you might have heard of that. Uh, not everybody here may have. It basically was a bill that, that would change the way in which uh, unions organize. Uh, it would give them, uh, give workers the option of organizing through a uh, card check process where they just would have to sign a card instead of actually having a secret ballot vote, uh, put in place some other provisions that we really don't need to get into here. The point is that a lot of states didn't like that law uh, and didn't want to see it govern uh, union relations in their states. So what some of them did was they passed their own state constitutional amendments saying that in this state, the only way a union can organize is through a secret ballot election. Card checks will not be a valid method of organizing here. Uh, but because there is strong preemption under that law, uh, the federal government went in and sued a couple of those states and said, no, th this law that you passed is invalid and has no force because this is a sphere where the federal government has carved out uh, its own prominence on that issue. Now, there are other places, you know, things like uh, you know, certain tax policies, uh, property regulations to some extent, things where the states do have more uh, prominence. Uh, what worries me a little bit uh, is that you see the federal government starting to encroach more and more on that, that state space, that, that sphere of influence that a state uh, should be able to reserve unto itself uh, as, as time goes on. And, and it's particularly true with regard to labor policy. Yes. Um, you started talking about free enterprise. 
uh, when you opened up. And I submit to you that free enterprise is dying in this country. I've been in business for 29 years. I have a small business. I started by myself, and I'm by myself again. I had the most uh, seven employees. And it's a quadruple whammy. You're getting hit by the federal government, uh, sticks their hand in your pocket, and then you have the state over-regulating. Uh, in my case, I did not have that many problems with the federal government. Uh, I understand Boeing and Pratt and & Whitney and those kind of companies would. But when you talk about small business, uh, companies that are 25 and less employees, it's more the city, the county, and the state that's destroying them. Uh, when I was 20 years old, you would go to a Burger King and McDonald's, a uh, public supermarket, and just about everybody working for was a uh, uh, high school or college kid that was working part-time to make some money. You go into those businesses today, and it's almost always a senior citizen doing those kind of jobs. Uh, everywhere you would find a mom and pop diner or a hardware store <coughs> or a small business, today it's all the franchises like Lowe's or Home Depot, Office Depot, you name it, it's a depot of some kind or another. <laughs> it, it, and that's well on its way. And there is an agenda, and it's from all the government, not just the federal government, to close down small businesses. So you wind up working for Walmart for a minimum wage or a little bit over that, and you basically become lower middle class if you have a job. You know, today, er Almost half of the population is either unemployed or underemployed. So <clears throat> these people here now that are going to be graduating college in the next year or two, what do they have to look forward to? Is there an agenda to close down small business? And where does that leave freedom? Well, I think you're right about the challenges that small businesses face. I mean, it, you know, you look at, at the regulatory code, 163,000 pages, you know, no small business owner can understand or even know about all the, all the things that are in there. Uh, but yet, you know, they're, they're going to be held accountable for them if, if they get inspected by one of the various agencies. And, you know, look, and, and there's some things that they should be doing, right? You, you shouldn't have a dangerous workplace where your workers are going to get hurt or injured because you're not complying with the OSHA uh, requirements. But at the same time, how, as a small business owner, you don't have attorneys, you don't have compliance officers, you don't have all that sort of stuff on your staff. It's extremely difficult uh, to navigate your way through that. Now, a lot of regulations do have uh, clauses which will exempt certain small businesses from having to meet the mandates of that, that regulation, but uh, certainly not all of them, so it is, it is very difficult. Uh, I'll give you just one quick example. I remember you were talking about the immigration issue, and, and I thought of something where uh, I've heard complaints about this from companies and even small businesses could be impacted by this. Uh, and it shows, I think, an example of where government sometimes doesn't know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Uh, and that is with regard to the immigration question where you've got, uh, you know, ICE, the uh, Immigration uh, Customs Enforcement uh, folks who are really cracking down on uh, the hiring of illegal uh, immigrants. And so they are uh, they, they conduct raids, they, they want people to use this, this E-Verify system, they want you know, checks on social security numbers and all that kind of stuff, and that, that's all uh, part of their job. Um, but at the same time they're demanding that companies do this, you've got on the other side the EEOC saying, well, no, you, you shouldn't be checking on people's backgrounds if you're uh, looking at, at the social security numbers of too many of your Hispanic workforce, that may be a violation of their civil rights. So an employer is sitting there saying, well, what should I do? Okay, on one hand, you're, you're hitting me with enforcement action because I'm not doing enough of this. And if I do it, then I'm getting hit from the other side saying you're doing too much of it. So uh, I think for if you're a small business owner, that's got to be an incredibly frustrating uh, process to try and sort through. Uh, you know, who, who do you talk to about that sort of thing? It, it's, it's tough. And then on the other hand, you have uh, most elections, you have 30% or less of voter turnout. So there's this tremendous apathy that people just don't care. They figure that they go and vote, and no matter wh who they vote for, Republican or Democrat, <coughs> they lose. Well, turnout has started to tick up just a little bit. Uh, you know, whether that was the excitement of, uh, of President Obama in 2008 or, you know, the, the severity of the recession or what, whatever it might have been, 
uh, we have seen turnout start to tick up, which I think is a, is a good sign that, that maybe more people are paying attention uh, and getting involved. So let's, let's hope that trend continues. Well, I'm going to uh, pick up with Nelson. So I think it's a really important point. You've been inside the belly of the beast. You know how Washington works, K Street, economic power, political power. Um, do, when, when, you, when these regulations are promulgated, they don't just appear out of thin air. Um, is, what's your opinion about the nexus between large corporations and concentrations of political and economic power to give a competitive advantage to one sector of the economy, i.e. Walmart versus the mom and pop hardware store? I mean, could you give us a, 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 an insider's view of what's going on up there? Well, regulations are going to appear probably for one of three reasons. One, you're going to have folks who are saying, okay, we've actually looked at what's on the books, uh, and we've decided that it really doesn't work, and we need to go ahead and fix it. And, you know, I don't want to brag too much, but we did a fair amount of that at the Department of Labor when I was there. We would look at things and say, okay, this regulation is, is simply generating litigation. It's not really doing what, what we think it was intended to do, so let's fix it. Uh, now, of course, not everybody is a good guy crusader in Washington, so there are other regulations that appear because uh, somebody has an agenda that they're pushing and they will use the code uh, to further that. And then there's a third way that they sometimes appear, which is, as you suggest, somebody will look at a particular regulatory policy and say, you know what, this is going to be helpful, helpful to me uh, at the expense of, of somebody else, and so they'll, they'll push that rule too, or they'll try and mold it in a certain direction. So, yeah, that does happen. Uh, but I think really it's, it's all three of those reasons why you see policies come into place. It's, it's not all just because somebody with a lot of money is trying to push something. I don't know if that's helpful Which or... Which you say is the uh, dominant of three? Can <laughs> <laughs> you give a ratio? No, I don't think I could really give a ratio. I can just tell you when I, when I was in government, uh, we didn't do a whole lot of regulating based on someone coming in and saying, oh, you know, I, you need to push this change because this will help me. Uh, in fact, we would usually turn that sort of, I shouldn't even say usually, we would turn that sort of thing away uh, unless it was something that our career folks, you know, there's the political appointees and the career folks who work in the agencies, they would, they would look at the books and they would say, okay, you know, this guy's pushing this policy change. It's really not consistent with, with the regulation we've got on the books now or consistent with the law, so yeah, I don't think we should really do it. Uh, and, but there is pressure like that that's put on, on the regulatory agencies. I won't kid you about that. Uh, there are groups that come in to visit them all the time from all sides of the spectrum, from the business world, from the labor world, from the environmental world, from all over the place. All the interest groups in D.C. Uh, do go in and they push the regulatory agencies to try and do certain things. And so, would it be fair to say that unions are, quote, big business corporations? And the example would be the guitar outfit in uh, Tennessee that was uh, well, put out of business for Gibson. perhaps political reasons. Gibson guitar. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that? How that scenario unfolded? Yeah, Gibson. You know, I'm not 100% familiar with this, with what happened with Gibson, but I think it does illustrate um, uh, another sort of crazy regulation that's on the books. I think th what happened with Gibson was they were importing certain kinds of wood to make their guitars, uh, which, if I recall, fell afoul of the Lacey Act. Uh, and the Lacey Act uh, governs trade in certain types of uh, plants and animals and things like that. And they have to be packaged according to whatever country you import it from. It has to be packaged in accordance with their laws. And if you don't comply with it, there are criminal penalties that, that apply. And, and sort of the famous example of, of the, well, Gibson is, is one, I guess, but the, the other famous example of the, of the Lacey Act just running amok is this uh, group of folks who are importing lobsters, I think, from maybe Honduras or something like that. And under local Honduran law, you're supposed to, to box them in a particular way. Uh, and these folks didn't do that. They still boxed them up, but they, they didn't do it exactly according to the way that the uh, Honduran government said they were supposed to. And, uh, again, don't quote me on this because I'm not a complete expert on this case, but I think a couple of people actually went to prison over this. Uh, they, they imported these lobsters. There was no 
uh, indication that they were trading, you know, in endangered species, that these lobsters were somehow, uh, you know, a species that were being wiped out or something like that. In fact, I think the Honduras government actually had repealed the requirement for how to box these things before these guys got prosecuted. Uh, but I think a couple of them went to jail for it. Uh, and, and I think that's the same issue that's, that's tripped up Gibson a little bit, that the wood they were bringing in for guitars was, uh, was covered by the Lacey Act. So it's, it's a big problem. I mean, you've got uh, a lot of these regulations, a lot of laws that do have criminals, criminal penalties associated with them. Uh, and for people who don't quite understand the intricacies of an individual, you know, I bet these guys were importing the lobsters, didn't even know yeah. that the Lacey Act existed. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they got tripped up by it. Um, I, I, I've noticed that um, you talk about, you know, like people, uh, there is a, a window to know about these things and stuff, but a lot of people mm -hmm. don't because they're just not informed as to what's going on. Um, I know that uh, local politics, you're lucky to even get like, you know, 10 to 20 percent of the, the residents in an area to actually vote in, in right. the elections and things that are going on. Um, I know this might be a little out of out of your expertise or something, but how would you suggest getting voter participation up? Because it seems like voter participation is a huge problem um, in the country. You know, like we're lucky to even get like fifty percent of people to vote for the presidency. Mm -hmm. you know, so, um, what would you comment about that? Well, I'd say one one example of how to get at that issue is what's happening right here. I mean, you're all sitting in this classroom at 7.30 at night instead of being somewhere else uh, hearing about these sort of issues. So I think that's one, is that people uh, have a desire to get educated about their government, have a desire to become informed, to become involved. So th just simply the fact that you're here, I think, is, is part of that answer. Um, and, and I, you know, I don't think that people in high school, for example, get much in the way of civics education. I know when I went to high school, I didn't. I don't know about anybody else here, if, if anybody here really had civics classes in high school or not, but that might be uh, an area where, you know, in some education reform, you might think about whether uh, schools ought to start teaching more of that, because, you know, the simple fact is people don't know how their government works, a lot of people. Uh, they don't understand how it works, they don't know how it works, and, and one of the disturbing things we've discovered in, in a lot of polling we've done at the Chamber uh, is that support for the free market system as a whole is not nearly as high as it used to be. And it's even lower amongst younger people, people coming out of college, that sort of uh, age demographic, where they, they actually don't think that the free market system is a good thing. And I think that's a very, very disturbing trend. I don't know if that answers your question or not. So, so you suggest education reform to help that problem? Yeah, I think, I mean, forums like this in particular uh, are, are very, very useful and getting people more up to speed on how their government works. Do we have time for one more in the back here? Do, do you think that people are not in support of the free market system because of, like, it can be kind of discouraging for small businesses or for, you know, or just because people want the lower dollar with big corporations, like what? I, you know, I, I, I don't know what the reason is for that response that we got. Um, I really couldn't speculate on it, but all we know is that, that was, those were the numbers we saw where somewhere around a third of, of people college age really didn't think the free market system was a good thing. Um, and again, I, I don't know why that is, but I, I think that's a pretty disturbing trend. I'll speculate. <laughs> they think they can benefit by the plunder of other people's private property, not realizing the consequences of a shrinking economy. I mean, that's what free enterprise is. You live in a country that's produced more wealth, more prosperity than any other event in human history. And there's no getting around that. Um, and that's why we have constitutional checks. That's why I started off saying private property is a fundamental right. And if you start taking away the incentive for people to pursue, quote, profit, i.e., get more property, it's going to shrink the economy. You might be a temporary beneficiary of that, but posterity certainly is going to suffer. I mean, you could look at a comparative analysis of countries that engage in socialism and their standard of living. Former Soviet Union, former Eastern Bloc countries. I mean, the proof is evident everywhere. You got Mr. Brown? Mm, 
I'm not going to say that free enterprise is a bad thing, but like he was commenting with him before, um, he's a small business owner, you know, and he struggled himself. Yeah, we might be the wealthiest country in the world, but if that money isn't being distributed to the majority of the people, so the majority of the people can enjoy it, and it's not really free enterprise. But see, that's what the market does. Nelson's suffering economically, not because of free markets, but the lack of free markets. He's talking about the regulatory policy. That's right. So prior to all these regulations, he was prospering. Regulations kick in, cost of doing business becomes unbearable, so his business contracted. So it's, the question is, we do want a wide distribution of wealth, right? We want prosperity. The question is, what are the means to that? Is it the government? There's a solution that government is this benevolent, omniscient, omniscient um, uh, omnipotent entity, and they care about your interests. That's not how people work. They are entrepreneurs too, but they're using the government, government to accumulate prosperity. So when we talk about regulations, we're talking about a bureaucratic system that benefits the people as the bureaucracy grows. So, yeah, you might be a beneficiary. They might co-opt you to thinking that, yes, I'll depend upon the government. But uh, it's a redistribution system that inevitably fails. The United States is a free market system, once again, has done more to promote prosperity, and, uh, opportunity than any other event in human history. That's why we say it's American exceptionalism. And as Ben pointed out, this next generation, which is a generation of budding socialists is going to kill this American exceptionalism. And that's why civic education is so important, because the framers knew this. They had history as an example. And even if all these regulations are, OK, fine, great, they're doing good things, I still, and you still, have a fundamental right to your property. And it should not be taken without your consent. Government by consent. Do you have? Does that bureaucracy in the bowels of Washington have your consent to redistribute property? We don't even know their names, who they are, where they live, what their G level is, the GS level. We don't know anything about them. And here they're running our lives? Come on. That's worse than the monarchy that we separated from in 1776. And that's the frame. And so when Glenn's talking about the executive branch overstepping its bounds, you're talking about establishing what we fought against in 1776, a king, a dictator, that governs by fiat and not by the consent of the government. Do you want to live like that? Do you trust human nature that they're always going to do what's right? I mean, that's why civics education, and in answer to the, we've got to get more people to vote and turn out to vote, I don't know about that. I don't want a bunch of socialists turning out to vote and electing out more socialists. Do you? Well, wouldn't that turn into an oligarchy? It already is. Or a plutocracy, whatever you want to does, call doesn't it. Doesn't an oligarchy go against democracy? Democracy, according to the framers, is a pejorative term. It means mob rule. They didn't like that. They used the word republicanism. So democracy, just because the majority <laughs> says, yes, I want to take that property, that doesn't make it right. Majorities have done horrible things historically, right? And the, when you say a democracy, it's not really government by the majority. It's government by a bunch of manipulators thinking the majority are in charge. I mean, think about what we talk about and how the system works and what motivates human political behavior. You're telling some bureaucrat, I'm giving you power over my life. Wow. You really want to do that? Think about it. So when Glenn's talking about these unaccountable, numerous, you're talking about thousands and thousands of regulations that you have not one inch of input in deciding what they would be. And you're talking about closed shop labor unions. I came from a closed shop state. And those union bosses were dictators. They decided who worked, when they worked. It was very much uh, geared toward nepotism. If you didn't support their political candidates, if you didn't go to their church, if you didn't drink beer with them, you didn't get a job. Don't think you, labor unions are this, once again, a benevolent organization looking out for the worker. No. 
It's a business controlled by, well, I won't say gangsters, but in West Virginia, they're pretty close to it. And that's why you have open shops. That's freedom. If I have a company, why should I have to deal with the union boss telling me who to hire, what they do, and what to pay them? That's not freedom and liberty. And if you don't want to work in my business, that's your choice. And the other comment about the invisible hand, it was under the visible hand that we had the Gulf oil spill. People think the government is really good at what they do. I mean, you, you've been in Washington. I mean, you, you really, I mean, think about it. That's why it's important to read history, especially the founders and the framers. They've been there, they've done it. And if, that's why I started off. If you love liberty, you've got to love free enterprise. You have to be very wary of government regulations. Very wary. So, but let's give Ben a hand.